Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're very, very welcome indeed to this afternoon's event, which is the latest event we are hosting this May as part of our IIEA 30th anniversary celebrations. This week in particular, we have seen our anniversary celebrations intensify with uh, an opening address by Antishak, uh, Michal Martin, discussions on Anglo-Irish relations, reflections on the role of think tanks in the age of so-called fake news, and then yesterday we were particularly delighted to host two very interesting webinars on the future of the European economy and the French perspective on the future direction of the European Union. Today we're turning our attention uh, to transatlantic relations and we welcome, warmly welcome indeed, Congressman Richard Neal, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, to discuss a number of issues on the US economic agenda, not the least of which of course is the stimulus and the infrastructure packages, but also of course corporate tax reform and um, not least uh, safeguarding peace on the island of Ireland. Let me run through briefly some housekeeping if I may, which I'm sure by now you're all very familiar with, but you will be, um, Congressman Neil will deliver a brief opening remarks and I'll then just uh, begin with some introductory questions and we then come to you our audience uh, questions and you can submit these in the normal way using the Q&A function on your screens, the Zoom function on your screens. We ask that you identify yourselves and your organization if applicable, and also that you try to keep your questions as brief as possible so that we can get to as many as possible in the time available. The discussion today is fully on the record. You can also get involved in the discussion on Twitter, and we encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag IIEA30. Let me now formally introduce Congressman Neil. Richard E. Neil serves as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the US House of Representatives, a position he has held since January 2019. This prestigious and influential committee holds responsibility over all taxation, tariffs, and other revenue raising measures. Representing the second congressional district of Massachusetts, Congressman Neil, Chairman Neil, was first elected to the House of Representatives in 19, 19, 1988. He served his first two terms on the House Banking Committee before moving to the Ways and Means Committee in 1993. A proud Irish American and committed friend of Ireland, he has served as chairman of the Congressional Friends of Ireland Committee since 2007 and is deeply committed to fostering US-Ireland relations and protecting the Northern Ireland peace process. So Chairman, Congressman, Richie, Welcome to Ireland, even if it is virtually. You're very, very welcome indeed. The floor is yours. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet with all of you virtually today. I'm delighted to participate in this event with my really good friend, Ambassador Collins, with whom I worked closely when he served as the Ambassador of Ireland to the United States in Washington from 2007 to 2013. As you know, in 2001, Ambassador Collins was appointed Second Secretary General in the Department of the Taoiseach with responsibilities for the Northern Ireland peace process, as well as Anglo-Irish issues in EU and international affairs responsibilities. Upon retirement, he became the longest serving diplomat in the history of the Irish Foreign Service, which is indeed quite an accomplishment. Ambassador Collins is certainly, he knows, it's been an honor to work with him over all of these years. So we are convening in a very optimistic and busy time. As chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives, I work with colleagues to advance important taxation and trade policies. Our committee has played an integral part in the United States efforts to recover from the economic and health crisis spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has upended lives across the United States and around the world. From the CARES Act to the American Rescue Plan, we have worked diligently to ensure that the American people have the resources they need to weather this storm. As part of our efforts to overcome the economic and health crisis, we are developing a plan with the Biden administration to indeed build back better. We intend to make such very needed investments in our country's infrastructure, and they will indeed benefit everybody in America, as well as the rest of the world. Our goal is to create good paying jobs and put our economy on a more sustainable path. I look forward to the continuing efforts of the Biden administration on these initiatives. On the trade front, we've seen President Biden his administration reaffirming our relationships with European allies and our other trading partners, just as I hoped he would. I'm encouraged by the suspension of tariffs related to the Boeing Airbus large civil aircraft WTO dispute to provide some time for the United States, the EU and UK 
to negotiate a solution that addresses the domestic subsidies provided to our respectful and respected aircraft sectors. I recognize the urgency of these negotiations in light of the anti-competitive practices of China and its state-driven model of economic and political governance. I'm fully supportive of the administration's announcement this week to start discussions with EU to address the very real problem of global steel and aluminum overcapacity. I'm very hopeful that we can put our heads together to come up with some creative solutions to address this challenge. I think we have ample room to deepen our transatlantic economic and trade cooperation to address the challenges of today from forced labor in our supply chains to the climate crisis, as well as providing future proof to economies that are market driven will work best. We are prepared to face the trials of tomorrow. That's not to say that we won't experience any difficulties in these relationships. As close as the United States and EU are in terms of our values and our democratic systems of government, we sometimes disagree when it comes to specific policies. Fortunately, we have Ambassador Catherine Tai, who worked on my committee staff for a long period of time as the United States trade representative, meaning she is the most foremost advocate of trade policy within the administration. She brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the position, and she knows my views on trade policy, including the importance of our US-EU ties as well. As the Friends of Ireland, we are watching the EU's closely evolving economic and political relationship with the UK. I, along with colleagues, have been in close communication with both the British and European government officials since the beginning of Brexit negotiations to ensure that both sides recognize the critical importance of protecting the Good Friday Agreement. It is the path forward. We will not negotiate on the issue of the Good Friday Agreement. It has to continue to be fully implemented. It is an extraordinary example of what people can do when they foster goodwill and provide for the prosperity of people on the island of Ireland. We've seen the inevitable Brexit teething problems. I'm encouraged that the EU and the UK will try to respect all agreements and commitments they've made and to make sure that that includes the Northern Ireland Protocol. It will protect the gains of the Good Friday Agreement. The Biden administration is encouraging both sides to continue prioritizing political and economic stability in Northern Ireland in a way that benefits all traditions as well. I know I've spoken to him personally on these issues. Separately, another challenge that we will need to address is the issue of taxation and digital economy profits. The Biden administration has proposed a new approach at the OECD regarding a global minimum tax, which all are considering. We will have to figure out a global approach to these specific taxation matters that do not unfairly disadvantage US workers, businesses, or our tax base. In closing, let me highlight that the Ways and Means Committee is considering all of our legislative initiatives through the lens of a new equity framework with an objective of making sure our policies benefit everyone equally. I recognize our European friends have adopted similar guiding principles as part of their trade for all strategy. And I look forward to working with the EU and other like-minded countries to make our trade and economic policies equitable. We will need to work together more than ever to build trust and to make sure we build a brighter future for all. It will take pragmatism, trust, and honesty. And Mr. Ambassador, I'm delighted to be with you today and certainly take your observations and questions from the audience. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, yeah, I'll start with a few maybe uh, of my own and then we, we welcome um, um, our uh, questions from, from the audience and we get to as many of those as we can in the time available. But maybe we would start first of all with the, uh, the what's happening in Washington and particularly in relation to the committee and then maybe we will uh, come to um, um, the, the Northern Ireland issue piece on the island of Ireland. But uh, you spoke about um, the president's determination and um, to build back better. Uh, 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 obviously, the, the president's proposals, I think, originally starting at six trillion were, uh, you know, uh, emerged and they're working their way through uh, Congress. But it seems to be very, uh, very difficult uh, to to reach agreement or to reach any form of consensus on that. Where do they stand at the moment? And what is the what are the prospects of, 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 of reasonable bipartisanship in delivering on this? Well, I'm going to exhaust every avenue to secure a bipartisan agreement. 
Infrastructure in the United States used to be the easiest thing to do in Congress. And even that has become more polarized in terms of the debate, despite the fact that both sides agree upon the need. So mid-June, the Infrastructure Committee will begin a markup. That is what is called an authorizing effort. And then shortly thereafter, the Ways and Means Committee, we will begin to model revenue and how to pay for it. As you know, the president wants it paid for in totality. So my plan is to try to make sure that we accomplish that. At the same time, there will be some revenue measures. I do agree with the president's uh, tax proposals. By and large, that does not mean that that's what will be the end product. Uh, members of Congress, as you know, uh, we do not serve under presidents, we serve with presidents. So we need to align ourselves, not with just the administration's point of view, but with the United States state Senate's point of view, and I would like to see this plan accomplished by August 1st. Yeah, and um, just uh, you spoke about the uh, the president's uh, tax plans, uh, domestic tax plans, and I think uh, the Treasury Secretary Yellen was out yesterday saying that um, and I think part of those tax plans was to increase corporation tax, or is to increase corporation tax uh, uh, back up to, uh, I think, 28%, 28% from the 21% it was during the, the Trump administration. Um, but uh, 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 Secretary Yellen yesterday was talking about um, um, a global minimum uh, rate of, I think she said 15%, which has come down from, from the 21%. And I know that's all in gestation within the OECD at the moment. What, what, do, you, what do you think are the prospects of delivering on that? And do you think the 15% rate uh, is in around where it's going to be, bearing in mind, of course, that our rate is 12 and a half? Well, I've been negotiating for a long time, Michael, and one of the things that I have advised members of the Ways and Means Committee, as well as members of the Democratic Caucus in the House of Representatives, to refrain from endorsing specificity as it relates to revenue until we get a plan. And the reason for that is that the administration has already moved a couple of numbers. And I think that uh, we want to make sure that the final number is the one that we can adhere to. Now, let me say this. I do agree with the president's initiative on a global minimum tax. The reason for that is clear, that many corporations, they treaty shop. They will earn profits in one specific country, but they will report as to having earned those profits in a different tax jurisdiction, generally a low tax jurisdiction. So as you know, the president's had a series of these proposals. Uh, I'm very friendly with Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, but I think that there is a broad uh, base of support for addressing the issue of where tax receipts are reported having been earned. Yeah, we had um, our own Finance Minister, Pascal Donahue, on yesterday, um, and inevitably the, the tax issue was, 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 was um, arose, and he has been saying for some time, including speaking at the Institute here previously, that that change was or is or what, is inevitable. He hasn't specified exactly no more than you uh, what the position on that change is going to be. But um, you know, knowing Ireland as you do, um, Chairman, is this something that Ireland should be worried about, considering the level of FDI here, uh, considering our current rate of twelve and a half percent? No, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the uh, finance minister is a great pal of mine, and we were supposed to talk yesterday, but we didn't have that chance. But I'm sure in the next few days we will uh, be in contact. Ireland has a very well-educated population. It is the entry point from the United States to Europe. The commitment that uh, Ireland has made over decades to education and to achievement is gonna serve them well in the global economy. I also think it's important to, to remind all that the relationship between Ireland and the United States uh, certainly will not be diminished because we have a discussion about tax policy, that's for sure. But I think that the minister's position, as he has at least tentatively offered those words, is likely to proceed. Yeah, I, I just see a question come in uh, from um, a journalist in the Irish Independent, Sarah Collins. And I just repeat the question because I just uh, I, I made up that question myself, obviously. But just to uh, just to, to 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 give her words on it, she says, "Can you comment on the U.S. Treasury's latest proposal for a 15% global minimum tax rate?" I think you've done that. And uh, this is lower than the 21% first proposed. Do you think it would bring Ireland on board? And more broadly, do you think Ireland's low tax strategy can continue if and when a global deal is done? Maybe just on that latter point. In other words, is you know, can can we still in this country expect to be able to maintain uh, or be a low tax environment in the way that we have been? 
Yes, I do think so, because uh, Ireland is a market-driven economy. And uh, I, as long as I've been in public life, I've still not been able to uh, alter the rules of supply and demand. And again, an educated workforce, the gateway to Europe is Ireland. And the commitment that Ireland has made internationally everywhere, uh, I think, will stand the test of time. So I think that it's not worrisome. These discussions will uh, proceed. And I do want to say once again, as I did at the outset, uh, the president's had a couple of positions, as you know, as it relates to the global minimum tax uh, proposal. So that's the reason that uh, even though I've talked to the secretary a number of times, that I've refrained from embracing anything as we proceed with negotiations. Well, that sounds like a man with a lot of experience in this field. I see that, that also echoes, echoes a question from Jack. And scars. <laughs> it also echoes a question from Jack Power in the Irish Times. I, I suppose he's got an additional dimension to his question. Uh, he says, uh, uh, how does Congressman Neil feel, uh, feel Ireland's likely opposition or hesitancy to any move to raise its 12.5% corporate tax to a proposed higher global minimum rate will be received in the United States? In other words, I suppose... What's, I suppose, maybe just more generally uh, the, that question, but what's the perception of Ireland and, and our tax regime at the moment? Is there, is there, is there a reasonable understanding of, of why, we, why we have the rate we have and why we have positioned ourselves the way that we have? Well, I think it's, uh, for me, I've understood clearly uh, why that occurred. I thought that for a long period of time that they had a very uh, uh, assertive position as it related uh, to global tax. Uh, but at the same time, in an international uh, economy, a clear measure uh, for all of us is to harmonize international tax rates. I mean, treaty shopping is unhealthy for the global economy. And I, I think that if those who simply uh, move from one jurisdiction in tax to another for the purpose of avoiding tax uh, needs to be smoothed. So I think that with the president at 15% as of yesterday, the secretary having been negotiating regularly with allies across the European Union, I think that the uh, president's position is sound. And let me just say this as well. As you know, I want a global agreement between the United States and European Union in terms of trade. I want to embrace TTIP once again. I've talked to Catherine Tai, I've talked to the president about this, and I am all in on an agreement with European Union. That in and of itself will invite a harmonized tax regime. Okay, um, just the, um, the, 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 we had uh, Larry Summers was on our, one of our platforms there last week or was it the week before that he was, he was moderated at an event, an event moderated by our chief economist, Dan O'Brien, who also has a question here, just uh, following up on uh, Larry Summers' um, um, conversation with us, which he, which he says, uh, while, um, uh, while the president favors big federal government uh, stimulus package, uh, he believes that the Biden administration's plans go too far, right? Uh, do you share any of his concerns? And of course, I heard what you said earlier on that these things are evolving, perhaps. But uh, is it too big? Is it too big to 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 be sustained in terms of support within Congress? Well, I take great satisfaction in the fact that Speaker Pelosi and I, and Secretary Mnuchin, the former Secretary of the Treasury, we wrote the CARES Act in a matter of hours in terms of the parameters. It saved the American economy, but that was really not stimulus. That was trying to buy some time to get past the pandemic. The pandemic was not related to malfeasance or corruption. It was related to an international pandemic. And I think that now build back better should be the path forward. And I agree with the president's thrust. In addition to which, I think that America's uh, infrastructure is in really bad shape. Let me say a word of compliment to you because you spoke to me about this with the completion of the new airport in Dublin. It was spectacular. I remember talking to you and complimenting Ireland on its commitment to infrastructure. You know, one of the things that Ireland benefited from that everybody uh, should recognize, you took full advantage of the early stages of European Union. You made broad investments in infrastructure everywhere and it's paid a handsome dividend. And in the United States, I think that uh, we need to regenerate our interests in infrastructure and broadband, sewer and water, highways, roadways, bridges, airports, we are fully capable of doing it. And within the proposal that the president has offered, I think that there's considerable room to accomplish just that. Very good. And, and you wouldn't be prepared at this stage, no doubt, to put a sort of the, the likely final figure on this in terms of what it might amount to. In. <laughs> I think that's a no. I, I, <laughs> I have a goal in mind. 
Okay, very good. Well, we'll hear about it in June. Michael, is, you'll like this, Michael, as I have said to committee members on the Ways and Means Committee, for the moment, keep it vague. Okay, okay, vague is good. Listen, just, um, just um, I think I've heard you speak before, uh, Congressman, about all, um, uh, reshoring, uh, you know, and of course it's become all the more topical now, uh, relevant and maybe um, uh, critical maybe in, in some respects uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, what's your current position in terms of uh, the repatriation of U.S. companies uh, back to the United States? And of course, within that, do you see kind of a serious downside in implications for Ireland? No, I don't. And I, I will say this, that it, there are a lot of issues that arise that go well beyond the simplicity of stating that we want to reassure. There are competitive costs that will have to be addressed. For example, we discovered, I think, with the PPP programs that uh, a lot of the masks that we did not have a, uh, a substantial uh, majority of, they can be replicated and constructed in, in countries that have low wages. Not Ireland, but there are other parts of the world, particularly in Asia. And trying to reshore uh, is to run up against, again, the law of supply and demand. So we have to be careful on that. We ran into a real problem, for example, uh, with ventilators. It is still very difficult to inventory ventilators. So there are some realities here as it relates to economics, and we have to address that. But I think in the area of uh, computer chips, that's something that we can address. I think right now our economy is a bit uh, stalled on that very issue of, of uh, making sure that our, our automobile sector, for example, is able to secure the necessary hardware and software and that largely plays out against a global economy. You mentioned there, uh, uh, Chairman, just the relations with uh, the European Union. And um, I think it's uh, for all of us, it's gratifying the extent to which uh, uh, President Biden you know, has put the European Union back, back at the center of, uh, of US uh, uh, politics. Um, to what extent, uh, I mean, and obviously within that, the whole China dimension uh, comes in. I mean, can you see a situation where Europe can reasonably navigate its way between um, uh, the United States and China, or do we have to be all in with the United States? I think that uh, we remind ourselves here that there are 500 million consumers in European Union. I think that that makes for a grand opportunity for American business uh, to secure a strong financial footing. What I object to with China is that in a sovereign form of capitalism, that they are able to bully their way to quick decision-making, even if it's not sturdy decision-making. They are making advances in Africa and Central America and South America and Europe, although the Europeans, I think, have now become a bit more suspicious of their overall intent. The most important relationship, I think, in the world is that between the United States and China and making sure that we try to, as best we can, navigate those uh, challenging moments is critical but not to miss the point that we intend to be a fully invested in European Union. And I think getting that trade agreement up that lagged in the uh, uh, Obama administration and then was thwarted in the Trump administration should be a priority for President Biden. And I've expressed that to him. Pretty good. I think I was with you the night in Congress in 2013 when, uh, when President Obama you know, endorsed TTIP or the beginning of negotiations on TTIP. Obviously, there's a bit of water under the bridge uh, since then. So let's see where it goes. And maybe just uh, pick up on a question from uh, Kevin Layden, who is from our IIEA um, sister organization in Brussels. He says, looking to the future, what steps are most helpful in establishing closer EU-US relations within which US, Irish, and UK relations can flourish? Um, so. Well, I, I mean, I think that uh, we want to make sure that uh, that relationship remains strong. And at the same time, I think that one of the challenges that uh, Brexit brought about was the threat to the border in the north of Ireland. And I think it's a great reminder here for all that the champions or the Brexiteers, they told everybody that this was going to be easy that this was gonna be simple, that their divorce from European Union would not come with any attached economic woes. And those of us who have participated in big trade agreements, including the recent USMCA in the United States, the largest in the history of the world, that we knew there would be difficulties that would come with, with Brexit. So I think that uh, we don't, I wanna make sure that in this relationship with this profound, I wanna make sure that there is no threat to the success we've had, not just with the Good Friday Agreement, 
but with making sure that it remains a template for the rest of the world to examine for their own longstanding challenges. Okay, um, just um, I have a question here from um, from a colleague of mine at the Institute. He just talks about whether, I suppose, um, he says, are you concerned that the US economy is overheating um, given the latest April 2021 uh, inflation figures of 4.2% and the low um, job growth numbers reported? And in a related question, how can the US improve its labor supply in the coming years as it recovers from the pandemic? And maybe that'll just bring us or segue us a little bit into the immigration issue as well. Sure, I think that supply is gonna catch up with demand as uh, time goes on. I, I think that coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic, I hesitate to say that we're on the other side of it, but I think that we've made extraordinary uh, progress. And my own sense is that uh, Jay Powell at the Federal Reserve Board has done a really fine job of navigating these difficult uh, uh, months. So he has suggested that interest rates are gonna remain where they are for the foreseeable future. But he also indicated uh, that they were going to examine some of their current policies as it relates to bond buying in international markets. So I'm optimistic. I feel pretty good about it. I, I think that we do have to keep an eye on inflation, but I think for the moment we should see it more as a bit of a hiccup as opposed to a long-term policy. Yeah. I think that's something that Philip Lane, our, our, the ECB chief economist yesterday, I think echoed in, in a webinar we had with him yesterday uh, with Pascal Donahue. But maybe I could just come to those events of the 6th of January, um, uh, Chairman. And a question here from uh, Bill Emmett, who's the former editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine and uh, Trinity uh, College um, Dublin Long Room Hub and for Arts and Humanities. And Bill is looking for um, reassurance. So he wants to know, he says, um, Many Europeans felt relieved last November and again on January 6th at the fact that the US democratic institutions had proven resilient against assault and insurrection, but it is plain that the assault is continuing. What can and will the White House and the Democratic Party do to make sure that the US democracy, uh, that US democracy will not uh, just be protected, but also restored and will still be intact in five to 10 years time? He just says, please reassure us. Well, I'm happy to reassure you. We invest here in America in our institutions, not in personalities. And I think that as one who was trapped in the Capitol during those grim hours, uh, my office is right off the floor of the House of Representatives. And I will say that uh, not only were they at the door, but the Capitol Police inside of my office had their guns drawn. Now, I also wanna say that uh, an underreported part of what happened on that day was that at 3.30 a.m., we marched back into the House of Representatives and certified the election of Joe Biden as president of the United States. This nonsense that some are peddling that there was some falsity to the election outcome is just that nonsense. And I think that again, it's our institutions, it's our constitution, it's the Bill of Rights. But the truth of the matter is that the elections in America in the last round were amongst the most accurate in American history. The idea that there was widespread fraud is crazy. And I think that those forces of the insurgency, and that's just what it was, an insurgency. It was not a threat to democracy because of our institutions. I do think it would be more helpful if we could all speak in unison about those events. I heard a Republican Congressman, this is not a partisan, partisan statement. He said last week, it looked like a usual tourist event. At the same time, there's a photo of him holed up in the House of Representatives with security guards pushing against the wall. So when I, I was, a matter of fact, I can tell you, you talk about the irony of this conversation. I was on the call with Brandon Lewis when the office was assailed. And I, I think that uh, when I look back at that, it is critical to remember that we certified the election as we were supposed to do on January 6th, hours after this assault on the Capitol. Mm. But uh, uh, Chairman, just, but obviously America seems to us on the outside to, and perhaps on the inside too, to remain uh, deeply divided. And how can this um, fracture or these fractures be healed? And uh, how significant is former President uh, Trump in US politics at this time? And do you think that he intends uh, to try and stage a comeback uh, for, for 2024? Well, his shadow looms large in the Republican Party. I don't think that that's in dispute. And at the same time, I think that uh, the problem is 
uh, it's the challenges that are presented by our primary system where parties compete in an inter-party uh, electioneering. And I think that uh, his support is more important in a Republican primary than it is in a general election. And I think that that's what's kept a lot of Republicans uh, at bay. But we've also embraced in America for a considerable period of time, much to my disappointment, this uh, anti-government talk. And that meant that a lot of people got elected to Congress and to the Senate by running against Congress. And the challenge with that is that they can never come to the conclusion of a successful agreement because somehow the institutions that they ran against in their belief, or at least their professed beliefs, mean that uh, it can't happen. And I dispute that. But in addition to which, I do think that uh, the two parties, it's the base of the two parties that is uh, certainly orchestrated by a careful effort to agitate the base and keep them charged up 24 hours a day when uh, people like myself, Speaker Pelosi and uh, Joe Biden and others, we're institutionalists. And I think this polarized, this charged debate that is uh, amplified by social media, by Twitter, 24 hours a day, half-truths, suspicions, these crazed uh, comments that, that are witnessed by these conspiracy theories. It takes days to knock those down. Sometimes it takes weeks to knock them down. The problem is they gain traction in the interim, and I think we should be dismayed by it. But at the same time, all of us, we need as civil authorities to push back against the crazed nature of these challenges. Okay. Uh, just uh, if I may just talk in general terms, uh, Chairman, about Irish America. Um, obviously, uh, there's a question in here from a colleague of mine, Alex Conway, is a researcher in the IIEA. He says, what does the future of Irish America look like in a more multicultural and diverse America? And what does this mean for U.S. relations with Ireland and the EU? And I suppose the, the more broad, broader question is, uh, how is it going to be possible uh, to maintain the level of interest that you represent, for example, and uh, you know, on Irish issues. Uh, is this a declining phenomenon? And, and how can we best protect what is an extraordinary uh, relationship, uh, you know, which is, uh, which is in, underpinned by people like your, your good self? Well, I think that the, uh, the cultural achievements of Ireland certainly help to, to keep the argument refreshed. And I think that uh, it's, it's also uh, this profound belief, how can you imagine America without the Irish? And in succeeding generations, uh, I think that many of those loyalties have remained intact. And I would also point out that the genius of America was this proposition that I support called the unity without uniformity. But I also think that culturally, many of us adhere to this strong belief that it was the antecedents of uh, grandparents and parents who uh, struggled uh, that Codell that I hosted some years ago, one of the most striking parts about it with 15 members of the uh, delegation, I think, uh, which were met with great hospitality in Ireland. Everybody had at least one parent or grandparent who was born in Ireland. <laughs> That's not that long ago. Mm. So I think that uh, we are united in our uh, belief that culturally, you can be a grand citizen of the United States, participate fully, but also place great honor on what it was that we learned along the way from parents and grandparents who left that island. That's very good. Okay, um, so obviously I just, for my own time there, just appreciate more particularly uh, just that the public an incredible um, connection it represents and, uh, and obviously something very important for a small country. And we saw that manifest in the case of, of Brexit, obviously. You were here on a CODEL, Congressional Dele Delegation, I think in, in, in April 2019, or rather famous one with the, with the, with the speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, or with Nancy Pelosi at the time. Um, so I, I don't know whether um, the, you know the, uh, the prospect of a further such visit is, is, is possible, or have you any plans for a visit which would further give you a chance to amplify your views uh, on these issues? Well, as you know, I'm always happy to amplify my views on Ireland. And uh, I will also say to you, Michael, because we worked very closely uh, through a lot of years there on some very, very uh, difficult issues. One of the most satisfying moments of what has been a long career now, dating back to the hunger strikes, uh, was standing next to the speaker or what formerly had been the border between the Republic and the North. And to have the speaker say, and for me to reinforce, there can be no trade agreement with the UK 
if there's any diminished interest in that border success. And at the same time, if there was any restoration of the border, there would be no chance of a bilateral trade agreement with the UK. Uh, I, I look back at that with not only fondness, but determination, but to stand there and say that the Good Friday Agreement, where everybody had to give up something to bring about the new day, was accomplished. And do you, do you, do you I mean, you reiterated it there, um, uh, Chairman, uh, uh, the, the fact that no trade deal with, you know, if there's any threat to the, uh, the restoration or just any question of the restoration of the border, the hard, a hard border of the island of Ireland. Have you been able to, and clearly uh, the, uh, the, the, that message I'm sure has got through to, to London, um, is, is this something that, that, that you've had an opportunity to articulate and for, as forcefully as you've done here uh, with the UK government, whether in Washington uh, or, or indeed in London and directly? Uh, and to what extent you know, have they taken that on board in terms of their expectations uh, about a trade deal with uh, the United States? And where, where is that trade deal or the prospects of that trade deal at the moment? Well, the trade deal uh, is in the hands of the United States trade representative who worked for me <laughs> and uh, Catherine Ty, and she understands fully because she's been in uh, conversations uh, with the UK. Look, we recognize that a trade agreement with the UK is desirable. And at the same time, the United States is a guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. I've expressed this as recently as this week and uh, I thought very good conversations. But we need everybody to recognize that the three strands of the Good Friday Agreement need to be acknowledged and honored. And for those of us who have supported the nationalist position for decades, our place in this argument was clear. We were able to intervene to stop the gun running that came from the United States. And at the same time, that would mean that there would be good faith negotiations and in strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, Dublin, Belfast, it has worked. I recall years of being with Tom Foley as the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House on a bus traveling uh, between Derry and Donegal, where the bus was stopped and searched by British soldiers with night vision and full guns. Now you cross that border and your phone pinks. That's the success that we've witnessed. And despite some of the rumbles, uh, I think that uh, there still is enough goodwill to see this through. But I have encouraged the UK to verbally acknowledge the success of the Good Friday Agreement more vigorously. Okay. And do you think, uh, Chairman, that there's um, a necessity uh, or an, a, an intention or an expectation uh, that President Biden will appoint a special envoy. Do you think such an, an envoy is required again? And uh, what, what would you see that envoy maybe uh, achieving and, and, and bringing about in current circumstances? I, I think there's always a bit of a challenge, as we know, with an envoy, because George Mitchell set such a, uh, an extraordinary standard. And I think that always within the State Department, there is always this suggestion that somehow that uh, the envoy works for the president as opposed to the secretary of state. And there is, as you know, even within our framework of governance, there's always that bit of a tension between even the national security advisor whose office is in the White House and the uh, Secretary of State whose office is across the Potomac. Uh, I think that the, that needs to <laughs> always remain uh, fresh in our conversation. So I think with these bumps that are uh, occurring, I think it's again desirable to appoint an envoy. I urge President Trump in a conversation to do that as well. I think that uh, we were distracted by a lot of other issues. So there is a role for an envoy, yes. Uh, sooner rather than later, or I mean, obviously- uh, any sooner, kind of sooner rather than later. I think that it, help, it might help smooth the process uh, right now. I think that the disruption that is occurring over the protocol uh, is uh, one that should have been predictable. The North voted to stay in European Union and I think that the rumblings across the UK uh, in, in a long, well, in many ways is a result of Brexit. And I think that it was inevitable that this was gonna happen, but not to miss the point that uh, the, the North did vote to stay in European Union. And uh, uh, Chairman, you, you've had many, many dealings obviously with our own governments here and uh, obviously with successive uh, UK governments as well. Uh, have you been a little bit surprised about the, uh, you know, just the way in which the, uh, the, the, the negotiations leading to the withdrawal agreement um, were conducted and maybe the, uh, 
Uh, the, the complications that have arisen since then about something that was signed, sealed, and delivered last December. Uh, where, uh, you know, I, I suppose we have expectations of very high standards uh, in the way these things are normally done. Has the, um, has the, the, the train of events uh, and the complications that have arisen and the disputes over interpretation, can these be regarded as any way normal? I think that they can be resolved. But also, let me say this as a, a, a grand compliment to the Irish government and to the parties on the nationalist side in the North. Every political party in the Republic has carefully aligned themselves with each other as it relates to the issue of the border, as it relates to the issue of the achievement of the Good Friday Agreement. I, I can't tell you how delightful it was with that uh, codel that you mentioned with Speaker Pelosi to hear all of the political parties in the Republic and across the North, on the, uh, certainly on the nationalist side, and even a bit more subdued on, with the UUP, as I've talked to them many times, that uh, they want this success to proceed. And I think it makes it a good deal easier for those of us who, uh, through the Friends of Ireland in the United States, have uh, helped bring about to see this day through. So it's refreshing to me, refreshing, I think, to the Friends of Ireland, that we are uh, certainly all singing from the same hymnal as it relates to the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, just a question here from a colleague um, um, in the, another colleague in the Institute. He says, why we appreciate the fantastic links Ireland has through senior representatives like uh, yourself, of course, President Biden and others around him. Does Ireland need to be uh, realistic about its relations with the US uh, and respect uh, that the US UK relationship is more important um, for example, uh, he just cites the fact that, uh, you know, we're still waiting for um, a, a new U.S. ambassador to be appointed to Ireland. Do you have anything you want to share with us on that latter point and more generally about how, how the U.S. weighs up, I suppose, uh, its relationships with two very important uh, uh, friends? And I think we always said before we have a, a, a unique relationship if the U.K. has a special relationship, ours is unique. Uh, but how do you weigh up that and how do you... How do you come down? I mean, obviously your heart may be one place, but maybe at times your head is somewhere else. No, I think that uh, those two are, are, are easily uh, aligned. And I also would say that uh, given the pandemic and the economic challenges we've had, I think that the administration has been a bit slow with many of their uh, diplomatic postings, but I don't think anybody should read anything into it beyond the fact that it's the pandemic and it's the economy, uh, which is, we all know, simultaneously linked. So I expect, uh, I certainly have heard from a number of people who are interested in, in being the ambassador, that's for sure, and I, which I won't share with you. But uh, I will tell you that, uh, always remember this, and this is a direct response to that very superb question. North and South Ireland has a little bit more than 6 million people. The fact that they command such a center stage in American diplomacy is wild. It's extraordinary that Countries like that meet with the president, a leader of the Taoiseach would meet with the president, that uh, the diplomatic corps is all over Capitol Hill. Dan Mohall's done a great job uh, in his uh, tenure like you did and the many in between. But I do think it's uh, extraordinary. We, and we should never lose sight of that. And it's the old argument that I've embraced many times when we reach our potential, our potential expands. <laughs> Just uh, maybe just uh, as we were speaking about uh, the border there, and I, I know you're very familiar with the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and the provisions within it uh, for a, a referendum uh, on, 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 on Irish unity in certain circumstances. I suppose uh, the question here is, do you support the holding of a referendum on Irish unity? And do you have any particular time frame within which you'd like to see uh, such a referendum uh, taking place? Well, I support the referendum because it's included in the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, that's part of the, that was part of the, the uh, place that we found uh, agreement. And I think that that's really up to the people who live on the island as to determine when that uh, border poll would take place. That I think is really for the, again, people in the North and in the Republic to decide that outcome. But I think it's inevitable it's an eventuality. It's it's going to happen. And if I might not uh, trespass, but also to say this, I think that it's the obligation of those of us who have been supporters of the national question to eventually convince unionism that they have no threat to their identity in the United Ireland. I think that's reality. 
And I think that uh, I have pointed out many times that the founder of my political party, the founders of my political party didn't share my religious background. But through the evolution of time, I think generally what they supported in terms of economics and the principles of the common man and common woman were ones that I and most Irish in America at one time adhered to. That's changed a bit because you know there are more, uh, more Irish that are now less identified with the Democratic Party, but I, at the same time, not to miss uh, the overriding uh, consideration here, and that is the genius of the Good Friday Agreement is if you want to be Irish, you can be Irish. If you want to be British, you can be British. And if you want to be Northern Irish, you can be Northern Irish. I think that's often lost. And I have reminded unionism of that. You know, I stay in contact with them. I've had a strong relationship with many of the, the uh, unionist political leaders over many, many years. They frequently would make the argument, this is not a put down, they frequently would make the argument that they couldn't get a hearing in Washington. They did get a hearing. They just didn't get agreement. Very good. Um, and I know, uh, um, Congressman, you were instrumental in making sure that they did get that, 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 that access and that they, they, they had an opportunity to present their, uh, their, their views, as, and it's important clearly that they were able to do so. Can I just come back maybe, um, as we're coming a little bit uh, close to the end, uh, come back to President uh, Biden, of course, who's, who's indeed one of our own, just like, like you are. <laughs> so could, um, you know, it, there's been a massive change of, 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 um, of tone in, in the United States, uh, following his uh, uh, accession to, 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 the, to the White House. And to what extent is it a kind of a, 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 is it a more of a change of tone than a change in substance? And maybe China's one good example of that, that maybe the tone may have changed a little bit at least, um, and certainly has changed in Europe, on Europe as well. But um, so could maybe just characterize the president. Uh, you know him very well, you know him better than, 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 than most. Uh, what do you think he has achieved, I suppose, in the first 100 days, or we've gone past 100 days now? What has he achieved, and what's been the difference? I think he's calmed the waters. And if I might just uh, offer a keen observation, what a relief it is to know that we're going into the weekend without a Twitter storm coming from the President of the United States. And I think that uh, not only was it the use of, of his uh, technical mobility, the former president, but it was the ability to change the nature of the argument 24 hours a day. I think Joe Biden, as I've noted, is an institutionalist. He understands that there are rhythms to governance, uh, but his proposals and uh, his own candidacy still, they remain pretty popular with the American people. He is genuinely a man of the United States Senate. And he understands, again, the evolutionary negotiating procedures that take place in, in that body. Uh, George Bush Sr., who was a friend of mine and served on the Ways and Means Committee when he was in Congress, he had a very funny line at one point. He said that the United States Senate, he was convinced, was the only place on earth that could really slow down the aging process. And, and I, I call that up because that's Joe Biden. He's going to make sure you cross the T's and dot the I's as you go forward, but he's also going to embrace reasonable policies. He's a man of the institution, but he's also a man of this time. So it's a relief for me, I must tell you, uh, not to be responding to these outlandish statements sometimes 10 or 12 times in one given news cycle. And I think that that's Joe Biden. We haven't yet found, I think, Irish roots for Kamala Harris, uh, but give us a bit of time and I'm sure we will. You will. <laughs> but in any event- I have great confidence in you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but obviously, I mean, uh, who knows who's going to be in the White House uh, down the years? But do you think that uh, the Irish um, the, uh, and the Irish issues, and you just, I think, focused in there on just the the, the 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 privileges that we have, and I think they are extraordinarily we're in an extraordinarily privileged position. How are we going to protect that? How are we going to? I mean, we've come we, we, we've dealt with this to some extent, but how are we going to protect it? What you mentioned culture as well. What is the single best thing that an Irish government should now be doing? To, to reinforce uh, that those linkages, when perhaps uh, those in power won't always be Irish American. Well, I think you need to stay with it, as you do. I mean, one of the things that's great about Ireland, you send your best to the United States. I mean, in the years that I've worked with the ambassadorial corps, and you might expect I have a lot of contacts with a lot of governments because of the uh, Ways and Means Committee assignments that we have. But the quality of what Ireland sends to the United States in terms of the diplomatic corps is remarkable. And I think continuing those uh, efforts, 
across the board uh, makes a good deal of sense to make sure that the Taoiseach is here, to make sure that we're there, and to make sure that those cultural links, those political links, and, and now those economic links. I mean, the number of people who in America work in Irish companies is extraordinary and vice versa. So we wanna maintain those relationships. And uh, I saw Jack Kennedy, Michael, the day before the election in 1960. I was 11 years old. And my mother kept us home from school because his last visits that day were in Springfield and in Boston. And as you might expect, he got a pretty good uh, welcome in both places on the day before that election. But that wasn't the beginning of this relationship. The beginning of the relationship was largely through struggle. And it was uh, those the success stories of that massive immigration story that took place in the post-famine era where millions and millions of Irish immigrated to America, you know, for many of us, that's only still grandparents. And I think that uh, continuing those links, as I've described politically, culturally, and economically, can best be maintained by that constant presence and vigilance that the Irish government and those of us who are supportive of Ireland's extraordinary achievements for such a small country remain relevant and at the top of the agenda. Thank you for saying that, um, um, Chairman. Uh, maybe just uh, if I've got, we're coming up on the hour now, so we're going to finish promptly. Uh, uh, but just uh, just maybe come back to the committee, your own committee, uh, the Ways and Means, Means Committee, which of course is is the preeminent uh, committee in the in the, in the House, uh, prestigious committee, uh, and uh, one of uh, you know which obviously you you have the privilege of sharing at the moment. But this is a question from a former colleague of mine, Peter Gunning, and it relates to kind of he wants to know uh, maybe it's a definition of a question, but maybe it goes beyond that as well. But Peter wants to know. Um, he says, in the discussion about infrastructure, infrastructure, the definition of the term and its breadth um, yeah. seem important. Is the US measure as uh, emerging on the broader or the narrow interpretation? Uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we're traveling down the road now of the broader interpretation. So it's not just the road that takes us to work, it's the childcare that keeps us at work. So I think that those are realities. I think that labor participation rates have to be addressed in the United States. I also think that the issue of productivity increases loom large. And the best way to improve the quality of life in, in America is certainly to create greater paths to efficiency. And that's what the presidents are uh, proposing to do. I mean, I think that the earned income tax credit, the child credit and the child dependent credit all relate to work that uh, I've done. I'm proposing to make them permanent. There's a bit of a disagreement with the president on that. I don't think it's a big one, to be honest. And I think that we're going to find an outcome that everybody can live with. But I do think that uh, as the president has prescribed uh, these opportunities, they should be fully debated and embraced. So just uh, one one uh, final question, if I may, um, uh, Congressman, just uh, uh, it's on the climate side of things because obviously the president has come out very strongly to uh, uh, to to, re, to reconnect uh, 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 the United States with the um, with the uh, Paris Agreement. There's a question here from one of our researchers, uh, Luke O'Callan White. He says the Biden administration has made many changes to U.S. climate policy, such as rejoining the Paris Agreement, committing to net zero emissions, and major investment in clean energy. Why? is federal carbon price so far missing from this suite of measures? Well, I think reducing the carbon footprint as described by the question uh, is the desirable goal. And I think even as we talk about a, a net-based emissions program that's neutral, we understand that that means there are a series of trade-offs. So I think that the president uh, embracing uh, carbon neutrality by 2030 is a, a very sound goal. Carbon pricing, I think, can be met uh, with a lot of different avenues. I won't volunteer what my own personal position is on carbon pricing, because I do intend to get these initiatives over the goal line, and I want to make sure that uh, the conversations remain fluid. Okay, and one very one final, final, final question. I mean, obviously, uh, links and tr transport links between um, uh, and and uh, the connection between um, uh, Ireland and the United States has been disrupted because of the pandemic. Uh, it's not as easy to travel in both directions in the way that it was. Uh, when, uh, how optimistic would you be that we will soon see the Irish uh, traveling, uh, you know, in the in numbers to the United States, and more particularly also vice versa? I, I know. We're still working our way through the pandemic at both, on both sides of the Atlantic. But uh, on the pandemic front, are you? Uh, what's the mood over there now? Well, it's it's uh, 
full of optimism. I've been through these airports now for the last two weeks, uh, back and forth to Washington. And I've got to tell you, uh, these airports are packed again. So I think that uh, I would advise my constituents who have a uh, keen interest in the Dingle Peninsula, there's still nothing like a good stop uh, in Ishmore in August. Well, very good. Well, we hope that circumstances will allow that all to be resumed. I mean, um, I think we in both directions. So, Congressman, Chairman right. uh, Richie, this has been wonderful. And thank you for facilitating this. We've covered a vast range of questions, everything from global tax to um, Ireland itself and our border issues. You've been very generous with your time and more than forthright in your, your views as usual. We appreciate it. We would love to welcome you to the Institute in person sometime in the future. We'd also be very grateful if you could put in a word to President Biden and uh, com communicate to him that he would be very welcome at the Institute at any time as well in the future, should he visit Ireland, or indeed should he wish to do it virtually. But in any event, the connection is rich and we really do appreciate it. We would love to see you in person when circumstances permit. You can bet on it. I think I can safely speak for the president as well. Okay, uh, would you would you envisage a CODEL, a congressional delegation? We're talking, about, we're talking about that right now. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, that conversation is uh, much alive right now. Okay, and you think that might be imminent or in the, within the year? I think, oh, it would be within the year, yes. I think we were talking about the fall. Okay, okay. Well, look, we look forward to seeing you when you're in Dublin and the best of luck with your committee work yeah. and most particularly the best of luck and an appreciation for what the connections that you make with Ireland and our issues. Thank you very much indeed. All the best, Michael. Okay, thank you.